what you start to realize is that you've been sold one particular story about physics. And it's time to destroy the dominance of that narrative in favor of other narratives. Do we need a theory of everything? So uh, people go on and on about these different theories of everything because we don't believe that in the current understanding of the laws of physics that gravity is commensurate, compatible, and fits into uh, a quantization scheme wherein the wave-like properties and graviton-like properties of a, a, quant a truly quantum theory of gravity would take place. However, I always point out, and you guys have pointed out, you know, most of the scenarios where people talk about, as Kamran Vafa did on my show, as Juan Maldacena did on my show, they're talking about gravity in anti de Sitter space, in five-dimensional, uh, you know, uh, space times. In they're talking about an abstraction that is not gravity. I'm talking about abstractions that is not gravity, number one. And two, they are solving, you know, they're answering a question that I don't believe anybody has fully asked from the experimental perspective. I'll explain what that means. I, I said this to Garrett, so Garrett, bear with me. But John Preskill was on the show last week, and I said, Gar uh, John, you know, we say we need a quantum theory of gravity because we don't understand uh, gravity at the center of a singularity or in the beginning of the universe, if indeed it had a Big Bang. Uh, singularity at its origin. Uh, but what if, you know, we just, the, the universe is not described by a single Big Bang. It's more described as Roger Penrose's conformal cyclic cosmology or Paul Steinhardt and Neil Turok's ekpyrotic or bouncing classical cosmologies. These have no singularities whatsoever. They are not manifest at all. So that's one motivation. 50% of the motivation of quantum gravity destroyed, nuked, wrecked. Uh, but uh, and similarly, we don't believe there are any such thing as naked singularities where we could probe a singularity uh, visible. And I said, John Preskill, you are the Richard P. Feynman Professor of Physics at California Institute of Technology, a small technical college in, uh, in Los Angeles County. I said, Feynman said, I don't care how beautiful your equations are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. Now, I ask you guys, uh, we can't ever hope to access these two different domains, which are the only two domains, to my knowledge, uh, that uh, that quantum gravitational effects are manifest. Why, why would you guys spend so much time on this field where it may not even be necessary to unify gravity with quantum mechanics? Or is there a bigger Garrett, mind, project at work? Garrett, would you mind if I took that one first and then you uh, back clean up? <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> Okay, first of all, um, let's dispense with this issue of uh, the task of this generation being to quantize gravity. This is a very particularly quantum field theoretic perspective where the children of Bohr have always been pissed off that Einstein did so much better in some sense on his side of the ledger that he cleaned things up so that his children were impoverished, whereas Bohr failed to clean things up so his children have had a much richer world to mine. Okay, So the idea of getting Einstein to submit to Bohr uh, has been a long-held dream of a subset of the community. Uh, if you think about it differently, you could ask the question of, instead of why do we have to quantize Einstein's geometry, why not geometrize Bohr's quantum, which is exactly what actually happened. So part of the problem is, is that when you get your information and your news updates from Ed Witten uh, or the Institute for Advanced Study, which has gone, on, gone in heavily with string theory, uh, Nima Arkani Hamed perhaps notwithstanding, what you start to realize is that you've been sold one particular story about physics, and it's time to destroy the dominance of that narrative in favor of other narratives. Let's talk about the Feynman quote. Feynman, I believe, it was at Cornell when he made this comment that if your theory doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. No, not right. You're inst the instantiation of your theory is wrong. But this is the point of Dirac's 1963 article in Scientific American where he talks about Schrodinger uh, not incorporating spin and failing to get agreement with the experiment. The theory was basically correct, but in fact, the instantiation was wrong. This is why the scientific method doesn't get you out of as much when you apply it naively, nor does Popper. So people are not only in love with Popper and the scientific method, they're in love with very simplistic versions of that, with the idea that you can always go home and that rationality uh, and the scientific method is enough to clean up physics. No, you're copy editing physics. That's not where the real magic happens. The real magic happens in a tiny number of places. And Sabina is generally, by the way, correct that beauty tends to lead almost all physicists onto the rocks and destroys their career and makes sure that they're not very productive. The only problem with her theory is, is that it doesn't work for the far right tail of physics where it succeeds beautifully. And by the way, I don't believe that Wilczek's work is beautiful in the way that 
Um, let's say Garrett's work uh, is beautiful. Uh, it may be that Garrett's work is wrong, but his ideas are definitely beautiful. The way in which Wilczek's work is beautiful has to do with particular properties of, let's say, QCD at an analytic level. And I think that there are even different forms of beauty. Unfortunately, Sabina has decided that she doesn't want to tar target string theory directly. And so she's decided that she's going to be uh, tilting at the proxy of beauty because beauty is invoked by string theorists in an attempt to shut everybody else up. Well, she's quite correct that the attempt to shut everybody else up about the cosmic failure of string theory to deliver on its promises uh, is, in fact, a huge danger and may threaten the destruction of the theoretical physics community, which we need for a variety of reasons, because it is our most accomplished intellectual community ever, full stop. Then you have this problem about uh, Feynman. Now, Feynman, in many ways, uh, exemplifies for many people um, various things. And his aphorisms, uh, which I don't think he would have taken as seriously as his uh, followers uh, seem to, are wielded as weapons. If you can't explain it to your grandmother, then you don't understand it. I do not, you know, that which I cannot create, I do not understand, blah, blah, blah. Well, okay, but then again, if you look at the conversation between Feynman and Dirac, it's very clear that Feynman uh, really never had a fundamental law of physics. And the number of people who've done that have, have been extremely few in number. It's a very different club, and all of them appear to subscribe to the concept of beauty, which is what I view Garrett, for example, is pursuing. Now, Garrett is not going on to the rocks. Uh, his theory may be wrong, but it's certainly something that needed to be explored. It's a canonical theory, and I don't mean Garrett any disrespect, but when I met him uh, at a conference that I think Sabina actually hosted uh, with Lee Smolin, I had actually looked at E8 myself for exactly the reasons that Garrett has. Now, I think I've detailed a number of things that Garrett did that I didn't do with that theory. I think it's the second most interesting and promising idea. I don't think it works. But it needed to be explored, and it needed to have an actual physicist exploring it. And I'm, I'm very, very happy. And, it, you know, if my stuff, the only reason I want Garrett to be wrong is that I want me to be right. If I turn out to be wrong, I would like nothing better than for Garrett to be vindicated in what he in what it is that he's doing. So you That's think the he's real wrong. basis of this rivalry, mm -hmm. right? See? Yeah. But the issue is that I think that we've got all of these incredibly simplistic ideas. The most interesting thing that's happened is, is that all of the people who've been telling you that they know how science works, that it's all about peer review, that it's all about agreement with experiment, that it, 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 you have to be able to explain it to your mother, that there doesn't need to be a theory of everything, that beauty is a problem. None of these people have succeeded, okay? So at some point when you haven't really succeeded in pushing things forward in 50 years, almost, in certain terms, you have to say maybe all of the crap that we say is wrong. There's this marvelous scene, I'll close with this, in No Country for Old Men, where Anton Chigurh uh, asked the character uh, played by Woody Harrelson, I've forgotten his name, unfortunately. Uh, was it Carter? I can't remember. He says, if the path uh, you took led you to this, what, of what use was that path? Mm. And that's exactly right. With all of these things that we quote, popper, or agreement with experiment, scientific method, if everything has stalled you out for 50 years, why is it that you're not listening to people who actually have new ideas? Ask yourself that. I think one might say, you know, that uh, that people are maybe overwhelmed with Popper. I mean, I, I use this example with Martin Rees when he was on the show. Uh, you know, if you look at the pinkening and the reddening of the sunset uh, as the sun goes down to the horizon at uh, every night, <clears throat> that uh, you would be led most naturally to believe that uh, the round Earth has been falsified because <laughs> it's much more consistent with the flat Earth uh, that the uh, such a behavior should take place in an atmospheric slab approximation. So I wonder if people aren't overwhelmed uh, by Popper and overwhelmed by this is the counter that someone like Lenny Susskin gave on the show, that people are obsessed with it. And I can give another example. So uh, astro astrology, which I'm often confused for, you know, when I'm not confused for being a cosmetologist because of my awesome <laughs> Weinstein-like coif, uh, I am usually con uh, con confused with being an astrologer. And I usually say, yeah, I'm, oh, you're a Pisces. That's very interesting. That lump on your butt is cancerous. Go check it out. But seriously, <laughs> I, 
you know, astrology has been falsified uh, by numerous double-blind tests, including one in Nature magazine. Does that mean it's science? Because Popper says it's not science unless it's falsifiable. And obviously that's uh, meant to be a supplement, an augmentation. But Garrett, I wonder, what would it take to get you in this? Maybe, maybe it is an intervention. I'm sorry, Garrett. Sorry to spring this on you. What would it take for you to put all your chips, all your Apple stock, all your Bitcoin into uh, geometric unity? You know, for example, at what point would it rise? You say you've, you've studied it enough and you tongue in cheek say, you know, it's, you know, enough to be wrong, but not to be right. I don't know. But but tell me, what would it take for you to pursue? Because at the end of the day, we're here on this blue marble for, you know, 120 years, hopefully, but probably, you know, less in some cases. So tell me, what would it take for you to pursue you know, uh, another theory, Wolfram. Let, let, maybe that's not even make it personal, but you know, with Eric. But what would it take? Don't make it personal. All right, so yeah, why the two of us on the show? All right, let's go for it, toe to toe. Well, theory of well, everything. Eric has taken a uh, using a lot of the same tools that I've been playing with. He's built up uh, a very interesting theory in a very different way. So he has started with a fourteen-dimensional manifold that incorporates the metric, and then sort of gauge the metric in a way that accommodates its uh, interaction with fermions in a, in, a, in a way that is very different than any and then how gravity is usually introduced to interact with the fermions. So right off the bat, he's starting with a kind of outlandish structure that nevertheless uh, matches up well with known physics from a very different approach which is the sort of thing that absolutely I feel in the same way should be explored. And I'm glad he's exploring it um, because it's not the way that I would uh, approach things. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't start out by gauging the metric. I, I would gauge the frame, which is uh, equivalent to the metric, but is more natural for use with fermions. But, but Eric chose to start with the metric. And I think that's a very valuable way to, to, to look at things and to proceed. Um, for me to jump on board with then going uh, and swallowing and looking more into geometric unity than I have, um, I'd really like to see him get something like the CKM matrix out with, uh, with mixing angles appearing in some natural, reasonable way. Um, that's a high bar. As far as I know, nobody can do this in a, in a natural looking way. I can't do it. Um, Others haven't been able to do it. String theory can't do it. So it's, you want to just briefly say what the CKM matrix is for the kids at home? Right. So the CKM matrix it basically tells you um, that for your three generations of matter particles, right? When you have like your you have your up and your down quarks in your in your first generation, and your your uh, your strange and your charm quarks in your second generation, and your your bottom and your top quark in the in the third generation. Uh, what are the masses of these things? Well, they don't have distinct masses if they're identified as, uh, as unique particles with respect to the forces. So instead, their masses are mixed between those three generations. And there's a mixing matrix that allows them, that, that describes uh, how their masses are assigned between them and how they can oscillate between them. And we also now have a, a, a similar matrix called the PMNS matrix after the, the first theorist to write about it um, for neutrinos and electrons. And getting these matrices out of a theory is necessary for matching up with known physics and is necessary for, and this is where probably the, the new predictions will come from any successful unified theory is with these, the parameters in these two matrices and how they relate. And uh, it's very difficult to build your structure up uh, or break it down from existing symmetry going the other direction and get something like these matrices and their mixing angles out in a, in a nice way. And it's a very high bar, but if that were to happen um, for a geometrically based theory in a natural way that didn't sneak them in by hand somehow, that that would immediately command my attention and I would swap all my investment into looking at that. And I'd also see if it related to my stuff, because that's what theorists do. Theorists also always try to relate new stuff to theirs. But uh, that would immediately command a whole lot of attention. And like I said, it's a high bar. And, well, uh, and I think Garrett yeah. is also, uh, if I, I, I feel comfortable putting words into his mouth since he can take them out, given that he's here. <laughs> um, 
I think that Garrett is using the CKM matrix as but one of many examples. In other words, there are things that are concrete that show that there is a new idea present. And what is particularly bizarre is when people say that they have a theory of everything and there is no new idea that you can hear coming out of their mouths. That's right.